Well, hey, uh, thanks again for joining us. We are jumping into week two of My Shepherd, which is a walk uh, through Psalm 23. I can read, it's on the screen. Um, And so super excited to to keep moving forward in this. Uh, Last week, Pastor Tanner was here and he got to come up and he walked us through verse one. And so this Psalm, this chapter of Psalms has uh, only six verses in it. And so we're taking it week by week, basically verse by verse and just reading through what God is revealing to us. Um, In the first week, uh, Pastor Tanner read... uh, He read the whole thing, but started out and focused on verse one. And it's this right here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You remember that? Talking through God being our shepherd. God is the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd of us, of our lives, of our hearts. Uh, and, and, And how the good shepherd takes care of us. He provides for us. He protects us, right? Leads us to where we need to go. Gives us all that we need. And then that second part of, of being content with who God is, with God himself and all that he has to offer, not wanting more of the things that this world is saying that we need or that we should want, but simply relying relying on seeking and being content with who God is and all that he brings into our lives. Such a great week, such a great start uh, to the setup of all that is happening here uh, in, in this series and in this psalm. And so today we're going to move forward. And like I said, we're going to try to stick to a verse. I'm kind of breaking the rules and doing a verse and a quarter. Uh, and so we're going to look at Psalm 23, uh, verse 2 in the beginning of verse 3. So let me read this to you really quick. Verse 2, he makes me lie down. The shepherd makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Again, he makes me lie down in, good, or in, in, in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. So we get this first look at what the shepherd is doing with the sheep, where he's taking, where he's leading. And what is it that the good shepherd is leading us to here in verse two, in the beginning of verse three? We read that and we say, he makes me lie down. God is leading me to a nap in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Come on. That's a real thing. Jesus napped, right? We could say it's scriptural. That's biblical evidence. Some of y'all are waiting to get home. You're like, you know what, sweetheart? I just, God's making me do it. I got to go take a nap. Hands are tied. Have fun with the kids, you know? And then that's it. And you're out. Right? It's biblical. That's what we're doing. Jesus took naps. It's an important thing. So yes, you should take naps. It's a good thing. But I think what uh, the psalmist is pointing us to right here is something a bit more significant, a bit more uh, of a big deal, or it should be to us. And that is one word, and it is rest. Everybody say rest. Rest. Rest is a big deal. It's an important thing. And believe it or not, rest is something that is talked about all throughout Scripture. Okay, constantly talked about um, from actually from the very, very beginning. Take a look at Genesis 2. As God is completing all of creation uh, in his, his six days, and on the seventh day, he does something special. So Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So if you didn't catch it, God rested, amen? After six days of creation, of building, of doing, God takes the seventh day and he rests. He rests and he says that the seventh day is holy. The seventh day is a blessed day day. And he's commanding, we see all throughout the Old Testament, God continues this this picture of what he's doing that he implements from the very beginning. And he wants his people, Israel, he wants his people to follow it. And we see in the 10 commandments, God tells us to obey and follow the Sabbath, to rest. And we're going to talk about that word in just a second. Uh, Actually, right now, let's go Shabbat. Everybody say Shabbat. Shabbat. So that is the Hebrew translation of the word Sabbath. And what that means and what God, God is calling us to in rest is to stop. Simply that. Shabbat is to stop, to stop all that we're doing, that we're going to, that we're working towards, and just rest, right? And a couple of really important things to see about this Sabbath, this stoppage, if you will, that God calls us to in our lives and that he implemented at the beginning is that God says it is blessed right there in verse three. So God blessed the seventh day. God places favor and blessing upon this day of rest because he sees significance in it. He sees importance in it, right? Is it because God was tired that he had to rest? No. Our God is infinite, right? God, God, I don't believe that God just gets tired. Maybe Jesus took a nap, right? Like we said, there's, there's some stuff there. 
But our God rests, and I think he rests to teach us something about the significance of resting in him and his way. It is a blessed day. It brings blessings to us as we enter into the rest that God has called us to. The second thing he says is it's holy, right? He made it holy because on it, God rested from all the work he had done. This is a day that not only God created and has made significant, but it is a day of God. A restful day, a true restful day, God's way, involves him. It is of him. It is a time to rest in him and to worship him. Uh, there's uh, Pastor Tanner last week mentioned a, a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by another pastor named John Mark Comer. And I'm just kind of summarizing a, a sentence that he says about this picture of resting in, in God and worshiping him on, on this Sabbath day that we're called to, the seventh day. And he says that a day, uh, this Sabbath day, this restful day is a day of experiencing time with God in the things that drive us toward him and his goodness. That Sabbath day of rest is a day of experiencing time with our God and in the things, all the good things that drive us toward him and his goodness. We are called to this Sabbath rest. We are called to take this day and lean into rest that God calls blessed and holy his way. Once we get into the New Testament, again, you look at all those passages in Exodus where God talks about uh, following and, and keeping the Sabbath. Uh, there's this part where it feels, uh, where Jesus brings up the Sabbath with uh, some Pharisees and his disciples. So I'm going to read this to you in Mark 2, and we're going to see what Jesus says about the Sabbath later on in the New Testament. Uh, verse 23, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? So first and foremost, Pharisees just being Pharisees, right? Just following Jesus like, you're going to do something wrong? You're going to do something wrong? You know, just waiting for him to make a mistake or a mistake. Uh, and this is how Jesus responds. And he said to them in verse 25, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abithar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but priests, for, for sorry, excuse me, for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him, right? So he points back uh, as, the, as the Pharisees come against him and try to attack him with this. Aren't they breaking the law of the Sabbath by doing this? Uh, and what you have to understand uh, is that at this point, the Pharisees had added so many different legalistic traditions and rules to the law of God and kind of made it their own that it was almost like, man, you couldn't lift up your left hand and sneeze on the Sabbath, right, without getting in trouble. And so they're, they're, they're attempting to catch and trap Jesus in this, and he reminds them of a, a picture of significance of David going into the temple to, to provide for his men and how it's not seen as, as wrong in the sight of the Lord. And he wants them to see that. Ultimately, what he's pointing them to is this, these last two verses. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. Again, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So again, he places his lordship there. And he's like, hey, I, you guys have your rules and these things and a lot of the legalistic ideas that you're slapping on, on, on this, this law of God. And I'm not coming to say that the law is, is not a thing, right? Again, he says he's come to fulfill the law in scripture. And he's saying, I'm not coming to say that the Sabbath is unimportant, but I'm, I'm coming to remind you that I am king not the Sabbath, not the law, that I am Lord over it all. And with that, I also want to remind you that this was made for man, not man for it. So what is Jesus diving into here? He's trying to paint a beautiful picture of God's heart for his people. God has given us this day from the very beginning, and he said, this is a day for you to rest. Is there a call to obedience in the midst? Of course. But why? Because God knows what's best for us. Amen. And he knows that we need our rest in him. He knows that we need this Sabbath to be able to move forward and do the things that he has called us to do. It is a gift from God to enter into that rest. And Jesus wants the Pharisees and his disciples to see the, the, the Lord's heart, their father's heart for them in the Sabbath. Are you hearing that, church? So here's where things have to get really honest. We as human beings are not good at rest. Let me repeat that, but a little change it. Me as a human being, I am not good at rest. I'm just being honest. Um, I like to think I am, uh, but I've learned and God has revealed to me over time a lot that I am not great at rest. And I think there's a lot of us in this room who would maybe relate or could agree with one another that we as human beings are just not great at it. 
we're actually in a similar spot to the Pharisees, not in the sense that we have kept the Sabbath so, Sabbath so much so that we've placed all these other you know, legalistic rules and traditions on top of it to make it even harder to follow necessarily, but we swing the pendulum far to the other side. And we have actually forgotten the significance of Sabbath as a whole, the call from God to obey and to, to enter into the rest that is that Sabbath. We don't see the significance anymore. Why are we in this spot, right? Why are we in this spot where we say things like, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead? You know what I mean? Just like, what is wrong with you? Why are you so aggressive? You know what I mean? Like, what is, like, I'll rest? What is that? You know what I mean? I've got too much to do. Things like maybe, maybe if, I, if I can find some time to rest, I'll, I'll try it out. How did we get to that spot? A day off? Maybe if I can fit it in, I've got a lot to do, right? Why are we in this spot that we're in? First and foremost, like I said, I think we've lost sight of the importance and significance of the need for rest in our lives. We live in a culture that pushes us heavily towards the opposite of rest. We do. It's the go, right? Go, 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 go. All throughout high school, all people say, you know, it's mostly like these athletes that, like some of my friends, like the grind never stops. It's like, what are you doing, man? It doesn't. You got to keep going. Got to keep going. Keep working. Keep working. Keep working. The busier, the better. I heard a celebrity one time, uh, he used his platform to say, he asked the, 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 the crowd that he was speaking to, why are you wasting eight hours of your day on sleep? You don't need that much. That's a practical thing. Yeah, I know. It's like my doctor told me to, dude. All right. Right. But it's, it, it's a practical thing, a physical attribute of rest. But do you see the heart behind that? You, got, you, got, you need more time to go. You need more time to get after the things that you got to do. You got to go, 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 go. I remember being in high school. I, play, I played football, football my freshman year. Wasn't good, but I played. And uh, <laughs> my friends and I, before football games, used to watch this video, and it used to hype us up. And it was of this dude, like, doing football drills. You know, he, of course, he was just jacked to the max and, like, was, like, you know, he was, like, speaking real motivationally in the video, and he, like, had this beautiful, intense music behind It was crazy, guys. Uh, but it motivated us. But one line he said in the video that always stood out to me and that I remember to today is he said, when you want to be successful as bad as you want to breathe, then you will be successful. It's like, well, that's a pretty good motivational quote. Yeah, for sure, right? But do you see the danger behind that? When you want to achieve the things that you feel like you got to get after and go, 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 and, 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 and meet those goals that you've set before yourself and go, 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 I want to acquire this, acquire this. When you want that as bad as you want to breathe, then you will be successful. But you got to go, even if it costs your breath. Go, 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 right? The only thing I should want as bad as I want to breathe it's Jesus, Amen. right? If you want it, you want it. You got to go, 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 go. Maybe we're motivated for a little bit, but the lack of rest will always catch up. The lack of rest will always catch up. The reality is no rest and avoiding rest leads to destruction. It leads to being overwhelmed, having overwhelmed stress, leads to burnout, depression, anxiety, worry. The nonstop going of life literally takes the life right out of us. Amen. A study done uh, by Stanford a few years back uh, on the impact of, of the 40-hour work week revealed this, that those who work 50 hours above their, above, 10, 10 above, that there was a sharp decline of productivity in those people. Those who work 55 plus hours, they had little to no increase in productivity. And those who work 70 hours in one week had the same amount of productivity as those who work 55. That's one example, right? There might be some others that come in and maybe counter some of it, but there's a picture there of the more we go doesn't always mean the more we accomplish. The more we strive for, the more we're moving doesn't always mean that more has been done and success has been made. At what cost? More does not always mean more. The idea that we need to keep going as fast as we can and do as much as we can, again, not only is it not helping us achieve more, if we're being honest, it's at times taking the life right out of us. So let me say this, just as a quick disclaimer. In no way, shape, or form is my goal today to tell you to not be hardworking people, okay? That's not what we're up here to do. Having a good, hard work ethic is a good thing, amen? Having drive to accomplish stuff, set goals, is a great thing, and I believe God wants us to do that. Being a doer and getting things done is a good thing. Lowe's said so, so come on. You know what I'm saying? You gotta get after it. Striving to get better, do a little more. We should be doing these things 
And again, not everyone's life, everyone's job, everyone's doing is going to look the same. This may look different. Rest will look different to us, and we'll get into that. But nonetheless, I believe as human beings in this day and age, we have forgotten the significance of rest and how impactful it is, how God can use it in an amazing way for us to do even more, right, in a healthy way, to be successful in the way that God has called us to, but we need him to do exactly that. So that's the first reason that we are in this spot. The second reason I think we're in this spot is we're doing rest our way. This is huge for me, and this is me. Like, this is my struggle, okay? Again, I've been in church a while, and I feel like I've heard people say, you gotta rest, you know, the Sabbath, and I've heard it talked about for years, but I've never taken the time or hadn't taken the time to truly dive in and go, what is rest supposed to look like? I've always kind of assumed, you know what I mean? Like, what feels like rest? And tried to enter into that. Uh, Look back at Psalm 23. Uh, verses two in the beginning of three. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Who is in charge of how the rest happens for the sheep? Shepherd. The shepherd, not the sheep. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores me. Ricky doesn't lead Ricky to green pastures to lie down. Ricky doesn't lead Ricky beside still waters. Ricky does not restore his own soul. He does. It's God's way, not my own. Real rest is done God's way. But so often we try to do it our way. I got a day off. Man, I can't wait to binge this show, y'all, right? Come on. We still, sometimes the shows are worth it. No, the shows are really good, right? I mean, I've, I've done that so many times. And at the end of the day, I'm always like, why do I feel so tired? Just exhausted. And then I wake up the next day for work and I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> Mindless TikTok scrolling for a day. I'm, ch- I got, I'm chilling. Do you know on TikTok you can do this and wash your dishes? This, you know what I mean? Just all the, but I just, I just chilled. I didn't do work though. Did you feel rested afterwards? This is a big one for some of us. Let me say this church, going on a vacation does not necessarily mean rest, okay? It's a real thing, right? Especially if there's some family members there that are just, you know, it's just, but it's a real thing. We try to, I, I'm getting out of town. But did you rest? Did you do rest God's way? And the big one for me, again, the, the thing that I've struggled with is comparison rest. I need to rest. So my first thing is I go, well, how do they rest? How, how do they rest? Oh, I like that. I like that kind of rest. I like, okay, I'm gonna start doing that kind of rest. And do I feel filled up, restored, made new, rested? afterwards. No. Why? I'm not them. My rest, what I need from God and what I need to be truly restored may not look like what they need from God to be truly restored. Does that make sense, church? We can't get caught comparing rests and saying, here's how you should do this. Here's how, what does God say about rest? So what's the solution? The solution is we have to rest God's way. God's way for me God's way for you. We need to let God lead us to whatever green pasture it is that I need to lie down in. I need to let God lead me to whichever still waters it is that I need to experience and receive from. I need to let God lead me to whatever rest that he knows will be best for me so that he can restore me. You see the relationship in the midst of that, the individualism that God places there, him being personal with us and saying, hey, I want to restore you. I want to give you what you need. So maybe you're you're cool with that, but why? Why God's version of rest versus what the world has to offer, what I might think is best for me? Because don't I know myself pretty well? What does God's rest offer that nothing else does? I want to give you three things that God's rest offers to us. The first thing is God's rest impacts my ability to be present. God's rest, when I do rest God's way, it impacts my ability to be present. So Matthew 6, verses 31 through 34 It says, don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So in this passage, Jesus is going through his sermon on the mount and he takes a moment in the midst of this giant, amazing sermon where he's just bringing stuff to these followers. And he says, hey, I wanna remind you, don't be anxious. Don't live a life of worry that is focused on what tomorrow has coming. Because if that's all we're focused on, then we'll miss out on right 
now. Sometimes when you read that, I know when I first read that passage, uh, it says, so don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. It felt like Jesus was like, don't worry about tomorrow. Today is already trash, man. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, this is not helpful at all, right? Don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. There's stuff right here that I'm doing in your heart and in your life that I don't want you to miss out on. I am right here. I'm in the present with you right here. Don't miss out on this. What I think Jesus is truly trying to get us to do is to live in this present moment, not to miss out on what's happening right here, right now, because we are so rushed to tomorrow when today still exists. What does this have to do with my rest? How does this connect to my rest? Real rest requires the present. Real rest in my life requires that I am in the present moment. Think of it. If I'm on my day off, if I'm on my day of rest, my Sabbath, and all I'm thinking about is tomorrow, I'm not here. I'm not in my moment. I'm not in the present, in God's presence, sitting with him, letting him speak to me and restore me like he says he wants to do, letting him fill me up and teach me and rest me and give me all that I need. I'm, I'm worried about tomorrow. And when I'm worried about tomorrow, I'm living in tomorrow. I've got to be present in today in that restful time with God and stop, right? Shabbat, I've got to stop. Everybody say stop. Stop. I've got to stop. I've got to stop going. I've got to stop worrying. I need to be present with God because what this boils down to is is trust. When I can choose to to see the presence as an opportunity to rest in God, what I'm saying is it's an opportunity for me to trust God with right now and with tomorrow. That I may not know how all the worries of tomorrow are gonna work out, but my God does. And he's gonna take care of it, right? God will work out the work for tomorrow. He will help me get it figured out. He will give me the wisdom, the discernment, the, the, all that I need to do that. But I can't even accomplish it myself if I'm worrying about it because what I'm doing is I'm relying on myself, not on him. I've gotta be present with my God. I have to experience today to the fullest with him and trust that all the work will get worked out. And when we trust, we experience peace. And peace allows us to really be present right? And Jesus wants peace for us. In John 14, before Jesus is heading out and he's going to send the Holy Spirit to the disciples, to to his people, he says, I'm leaving you with a gift. Verse 27, peace of mind and heart and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. He wants peace for us. But if we're so concerned about what is to come or all the to-dos and how I've got to keep going and going and going, how do you experience peace at all? You're not living in the present with God and saying, this is here, Tomorrow looks scary, God, but not, nothing compares to you. Nothing compares to you, right? To live in that spot, to trust him. And when we lean into that trust and we lean into the present, he provides peace for us so that we can experience the rest that he has for us. A moment of honesty, just real quick again, is that, like, truthfully, I'm terrible at this, okay? Like so many times I think I've, I've got this idea of rest kind of under control, but it's, it's a struggle, the other day, my wife Rachel had to, had to shoot me straight and tell me um, that it was, you know, it was frustrating her how every time we go on a walk, so our, our neighborhood's like a figure eight, every time we go on a walk, I'm always like, oh, let's take the middle route, you know? Let's cut back home and not go the long route. She's like, why is it that you can't be present with us and go the long route? I like, hey, all right, all right, let's go. We got to get back. We got to get back. The stuff to do will still be there. Why can't you be present right here and experience this with us? Do you see that? We got, we got to get back. Let's take, let's take the short route. Being in the present, resting, seeing what God has for me and my family in that moment, in that moment, letting him fill us up. Driving. I do this, so, come on, I know. You. Let's be honest. How many of us, when we're driving, we're not worried about pedestrians, we're looking for the open lane. Where can I go? You know what I mean? <laughs> What's going to give me the, even if we're not even like, there's no time crunch. It's like, oh my gosh, this guy's so slow, Right? What would happen if you decided to be present with God in that moment in your car? Super practical. How would that change? How would that change your day to day, right? And again, of course, we're talking about a day of rest and the Sabbath day of rest. But when we lean into that and make that a time when we're present in God's presence, it impacts us in other places. It teaches us to be present in the moment with him throughout our days, all the way across. To not, to not lean into that rushing, always got to go so much to do spirit, but say, God, you're here. I'm here. Let's go. My kids in the morning, 
I had a, for, for a while at the end of this last year, just had a problem of constantly, like, even if we weren't behind, right, just being like, all right, come on, we got to go, let's go, get your stuff, get your stuff. Well, one day, I didn't do any of that, and we got in the car, and my daughter Ellie, as we get in, she goes, good job, Daddy, you didn't try to move fast this morning. And I was like, <laughs> sheesh. <laughs> Seriously, though, they, she caught it, you know what I'm saying? She realized my struggle to be present. So all you're doing is saying, go, 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 you're worried about what's next, you're worried, you can't rest right here with us in the present time. God's rest helps us to, to, to see, to, to prioritize being present because being present means we got to trust him. And when we trust him, he gives us peace. We've got to rest with him. Choosing to enter into rest God's way can help us to avoid moments like these and experience the peace that he has for us, not just one day a week, but in so many areas of our lives. So again, point number one, God's rest impacts my ability to be present. Second thing, God's rest impacts the weight that I carry. God's rest impacts the weight that I carry. Matthew 11, some more words from Jesus, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus talks about offering rest twice in, in this passage here, right? I will give you rest. I will give you rest for your souls. And then he talks about his yoke, right, and his burden being light. And we've heard, we've heard the, the, the illustrations, the example of back at that time, the, the oxen carrying the yokes on their backs and, and, and the work. And so many times people look at this as like Jesus wants to help us and move forward. And I believe that's true. I believe Jesus totally wants to help us in all of our things that we've got going on. Amen. He doesn't want us to carry the weight alone for sure. And I, but I think one thing he's doing here in, in, in a bigger picture perspective is not only does he know Life is heavy and full and challenging, but I think Jesus knows our struggle to try to be in right standing with him our way. Does that make sense? Are we following with that? Jesus knows that we want to be, we want to, our, our righteousness is something that we want to build. I want to do all the right things in God's perspective in his eyes. I want to check the boxes as the Christian that God has called me to be. The truth is I can't. And when I try to do that my way, when I try to live life my way and not the way he's called me to, I'm carrying a burden that was never intended for me. So Jesus says, hey, I want to give you rest because that looks heavy. So come, let me help you out. Come and carry this calling that I place because the calling, the yoke that I have for you to carry, it is light. It is ease. It is a gentleness. It is a grace, a love. It is a rest. But you've got to do it my way. Do you hear that, church? We've got to go his way, enter to that his way, carry what he offers to us, not what we try to carry for ourselves, to do right by him, to be right with him, to live this life in a way that we think we should be living it. No, just you, Jesus, because he provides the rest. So I have uh, one of my best friends. His name is Colin. Uh, I lived with Colin my senior year of high school, and one time we were just hanging out at the house, and his dad was telling me a story of a time when Colin was little, and he told Colin, hey, you need to take a bath go fill up the bathtub. So Colin's like, all right. So Colin ran and filled up the bathtub, you know. And I don't know how old he was. Had to have been like, you know, three, four, something like that. Uh, Fill up the water. And then Reed goes to check and he looks and he's like, oh, and the tub is overflowing with water. Colin never turned it off, right? The water's just overflowing. And so he tells Colin, hey, you need to drain that water. And he must have said it to him pretty quick or something because Colin immediately runs in there and he starts, okay, he starts, goes in and he closes the door in the bathroom. Well, a few minutes later, Reed hears somebody crying and he's like, what is going on? So he walks and he, he realizes it's coming from the bathroom. He goes in the bathroom and Colin's in there. And Colin, just with tears in his eyes, turns to Reed and he goes, I can't drink no more. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> this is a, uh, a very simple, okay, simplified picture of our issue, in my mind, of attempting to carry out a life in a way that we were never meant to. We go in, drain the water. We're like, where's the straw? You know what I mean? getting after it. And we hit a place where we just can't drink no more, man. Do you get what I'm saying? We can't, get the, we don't have the capacity to do it that way. We weren't made to do it that way. God's like, bro, pull the plug. You know what I mean? <laughs> Seriously, we overcomplicate it. We carry the heavy load and God is like, can I give you some ease? Can I give you something that's light? I still need you to drain the tub. <laughs> but can I be support to you? Can I help you in this? Can I be your God who shows you the right way and will never lead you astray? He helps us achieve that which alone or in our way we cannot. 
we need him and his way. The weight of life is still present. It does not mean that this, this, this rest that, God, uh, that Jesus invites us into and the weight that he calls us to carry it does not mean that life will be easy and perfect and there will never be weight. Life is life and there will be weight to come with it. Amen? But he offers rest for our souls in it. He offers an ease, a gentleness, all because of him. Because of total dependence on him, I can experience true rest for my soul, right? For the innermost parts of my being because of his care, his support, his strength, his guidance, his ability, not mine, his way. So again, point number two is God's rest impacts the weight that I carry in this life. And the third point is God's rest brings restoration. God's rest brings restoration. So what is this all really about, this whole conversation? Look back at our passage from Psalm 23. Verse two, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Just a, a quick thing for you. The translation there in verse three of my soul is actually the word me, just me. God restores me. As he brings me into this place of rest and provision and care, what he is doing, he is restoring me, not just in the spiritual sense, but in every single way. His desire is to come in and to restore me. That's what God's rest does. It restores me. And the word restore there, right? A translation of that is it brings new life. There's so many things in our life today and in the world around us that are pulling us in different directions. And if we're being honest, are killing us. They're bringing death to us because we have to go, 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 go. And God is saying, man, that's a lot of death. Can I bring some life to you? And not just in one spot, but in every single spot. Can I bring some life to you? Can I restore you, right? Not just pieces of me, all of me. He restores my peace, my patience, my faithfulness, my love and grace, self-control, my forgiveness, my understanding, my purpose, my joy, my body, my mind, and my soul. God wants to make it all new. He wants to bring new life into it. But I've got to do it his way. I have to let him lead me. I have to let him take me and be the one who helps me enter into rest, his kind of rest for me specifically. Because when I do that, he brings new life. Through the rest that he calls me to, God is bringing new life into areas that so many others are bringing death. I need his rest. I need the shepherd to take me as a sheep to the place that I need with what I need, how I need it, his way. You guys stand up with me. We're going to close out here. But I want to give you a couple things. Rest is hard for a lot of us at least. This is a challenge for me. Like I've said multiple times, it's hard to choose to enter into rest because again, tomorrow is always there. And so God challenges, calls us to be, to be present, to let him carry the weight for us and to do it his way. And he wants to restore us. He wants to make us new. He wants to bring new life. And so as we go out and we enter into this and, and, and we're beginning to ask God, okay, God, I want to rest. So show me how. I want to give you a couple steps that we can take um, as we enter into that to make sure that we're going in about it. We're seeking God's way in this. The first thing I want you to do, is check the grass right? He leads me into these green pastures. Some of us, pastures are looking a little yellow. You know what I'm saying? We got that Oklahoma heat kind of grass, you know? (laughs) But what does he promise? He promises the green, the best, the health, all that we need. So the point is, when I enter my rest, do I leave that rest feeling rested? Do I leave that rest feeling restored, made new, like life has been brought to me? Or do I leave it feeling even more exhausted? Check the grass and say, God, show me. God, I want to rest, so show me how. Take away opinions, take away ideas that maybe I've come up with that, that I think I know what I'm doing, God. Show me how to rest in you, your way, to worship you, God, to praise you and to rest the way you've called me to. I need you, Jesus. The second thing is to live from a place of rest. We, uh, as a staff, watched a, uh, a sermon uh, from Pastor Wayne Cadero a little while back, and he's talking to leaders at, a, at a, some ministry leaders at a leadership summit. 
And what he tells them is to, to, to leave or to lead from a place of rest. And I think that's such a valuable thing for all of us, but not just leading, it's, it's just living, right? And so practically, make sure that your rest is, is implemented before you do anything else. So many times we see rest as a piece of the puzzle when we, instead we should see it as foundational. I've got to have the rest to be able to do the rest, right? The rest of the stuff. I need to start with my rest. So can I start there? As I look at my week, God, how am I going to rest? I got to make sure. And I won't, I won't give, God, you've called me to it. I won't budge. I need you because the rest can't happen if I don't rest with you. Live from a place of rest. We have to stop seeing it as that peace and as foundational instead. Amen? Amen. We're going to pray, church. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for this time to gather in your house, God, and to worship you, to, to learn from you, God, to get closer to you. Lord, I just pray that as, as we enter into this next week, God, and as just time goes on, Lord, as we think on rest, that you reveal to us what rest is supposed to look like in our lives, Jesus. How should we be resting, Jesus? What is it that's gonna give us the restoration, Lord? What do we need from you? How do we need to rest with you, Jesus? It may not look the same for, for me as it does for him, for me as it does for her, God. So we've gotta be with you. We've got to be seeking you, seeking time with you, Lord, to hear your voice. Help us to do that, God. Without the rest, we can't do the rest, Jesus. We need you. Help us in it. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. It's in your perfect name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen.